We are reading Bud, not Buddy. In chapter four, we learned that Bud had gotten out of the shed and away from the Amoses and had um, gotten back at Todd. So now he's on his own and we're gonna find out what happens to him in chapter five. Being on the lamb was a whole lot of fun for about five minutes. Every time my heart beat, I could feel the blood pushing hot and hard on the inside of my steam spots and the bite on my hand. But I couldn't let that slow me down. I had to get out of this neighborhood as quick as I could. I knew a nervous looking stung up kid with blood dripping from a fish head bite and carrying an old raggedy suitcase didn't look like he belonged around here. The only hope I had was a North Side library. If I got there, maybe Miss Hill would be able to help me. Maybe she'd understand and would be able to tell me what to do. And for now, I could sneak into the library's basement to sleep. It was a lot later than I'd ever been up before, and I was kind of scared of the cops catching me. I had to be real careful, even if it was in the middle of the night, even if I was crouching down, sneaking along the street like pretty boy Floyd. At the library, I walked past a couple of giant Christmas trees that were planted on the side of the building. There was a door on the side with a light burning above it, so I kept walking in the shadows made by the big trees. When I got to the back windows, I almost busted out crying. Someone had gone and put big metal bars on the windows. Even though I knew it was useless, I tried tugging at the bars, but they were the real McCoy, solid steel. I headed back to the Christmas trees. They were low enough to the ground that no one could see me unless they were really looking, so I started opening my suitcase. Most folks don't have sense enough to carry a blanket around with them, but you never know when you might be sleeping under a Christmas tree at the library, so I always kept mine handy. I untied the strange knots that the Amoses had put in my twine and opened the suitcase. I could tell right away that someone had been fumbling through my things. First off, whenever I put the blanket in, I always fold it so it stops all the other things from banging up against each other. But those doggone Amoses had just stuffed it in without paying no mind to what it was mashing up against. I lifted the blanket out and saw that everything else was still there. You might be able to say that the Amoses were some mean old nosy folks, but you couldn't call them thieves. I picked up the old tobacco bag that kept my that I kept my rocks in. I could tell by the way the drawstring was pulled that the Amoses had been poking through this too. I jiggled it up and down in my hand a couple of times and it felt like none of the rocks were, was missing, but I opened it to count them anyway. None of them was gone. Next, I pulled Mama's picture, picture out of the envelope I kept it in and held it so the light from the library side door would shine down on it. It looked like the Amoses didn't hurt it. This was the only picture of Mama in the world. Running across the top of it was a sign that was writ on a long, skinny flag. It said, boys and girls, follow the gentle light to the misbegotten moon park. Underneath the sign between the two wagon, big wagon wheels was Mama. She was about as old as I am now and was looking down and frowning. I can't understand why she was so unhappy. This park looked like the kind of place where you could have a lot of fun. In the picture, Mama was sitting on a real live midget horse. It looked tired and dragged out like those big work horses do. But it had a teeny tiny body with a, with a big sag where most horses have a straight back. Mama was sitting right in the middle of the horse's back riding him side saddle, except there wasn't any saddle, so I guess you have to say she was riding him side sag. She had two six-shooter pistols in her hands, and the way her face looked, you could tell she wished she could have emptied them on somebody. And I know who that somebody was. Mama told me it was her father, my granddad. He'd gone and ruined everybody's fun that day, 
by giving a big fight with my mother about the gigantic white 25-gallon Texas cowboy hat that she was wearing. Mama used to tell me that hard-headed man insisted, insisted, mind you, that I wear that horrible hat. The hat was almost as big as Mama, and you could see it was fake because as tall as it was, no real cowboy would have wore it without getting it knocked off his head every time he rode under a tree or some telegraph wires. Mama told me that some man used to drag the midget horse all through her neighborhood with a camera, and if your mama or daddy signed a piece of paper, he'd take some pictures of you, then come back in a couple of weeks so you could buy them. Mama wasn't looking like she had rocks in her jaw because that hat was so fake that a real cowboy would have laughed you out of town for wearing it. She was mad because the hat was so dirty. When she used to tell me about it, her eyes would get big and burny, like the whole thing happened the day before yesterday instead of all those years ago. She started moving around our apartment real quick, picking things up and putting them back in the exact same spot. Filth, she said about the hat, absolute filth. Why the thing was positively alive with germs. Who knows what type of people had worn it? I'd say, I don't know, Mama. She'd say, who knows how many years it had been worn by who knows how many sweaty little heads. I'd say, I don't know, Mama. She'd say, the entire band on the inside was black, and I'm sure it was crawling with ringworm, lice, and tetters. I'd say, yes, Mama. She'd say, and that hard little photographer didn't care. Do you imagine it even occurred to him to wash it? I'd say, no, Mama. She'd say, of course not. We meant less to him than that horse he mistreated so. I'd say, yes, Mama. She said, but your grandfather insisted. To this day, I cannot understand why, but he insisted insisted. I say, yes, mama. We had that conversation a lot of times. Me and mama having the same conversation lots of times is one of the main things I can remember about her now. Maybe that's because when she tell me these things, she used to squeeze my arms and look right hard in my face to make sure I was listening. But maybe I remember them because those hard squeezing face looking times were the only times that things slowed down a little when Mama was around. Everything moved very, very fast when Mama was near. She was like a tornado, never resting, always looking around us, never standing still. The only time stuff didn't blow around when she was near was when she squeezed my arms and tell me things over and over and over and over. She had four favorite things to tell me. One of them was about the picture, and another was about my name. She'd say, Bud is your name, and don't you ever let anyone call you anything outside of that either. She'd tell me, especially don't let no, you ever let anyone call you Buddy. I may have some problems, but being stupid isn't one of them, and I wouldn't have and I would have added the D-Y onto the end of your name if I intended it, intended for it to be there. I knew what I was doing. Buddy is a dog's name or a name that somebody's going to use on you if they were being false friendly. Your name is Bud, period. I'd say, okay, mama. And she said, every single time. And do you know what a Bud is? I always answer, yes, mama. But it was like she didn't hear me. She'd tell me anyway. A bud is a little flower to be, a flower in waiting, waiting for just the right warmth and care to open up. It's a little fist of love waiting to unfold and be seen by the world. And that's you. I'd say, yes, mama. I know that she didn't mean anything by naming me after a flower, but it's sure not something I tell anybody about. Another thing she'd tell me was, don't worry, bud. As soon as you get to be a young man, I have a lot of things to explain to you. That didn't make me calm down at all. But that was Bud Caldwell's rule and things to have a funner life 
and make a better liar out of yourself, number 83. Rules and things, number 83. If an adult tells you not to worry and you weren't worried before, you better hurry up and start because you're already running late. She tell me, these things I'm going to explain to you later will be a great help for you. Then mama look hard in my face, grab a hold of my arms real tight and say, and bud, I want you always to remember, no matter how bad things look to you, no matter how dark the night, when one door closes, don't worry, because another door opens. I'd say, what, it opens all by itself? She'd say, yes, it seems so. That was it. Another door opens. That was the thing that was supposed to have helped me. I should have known then that I was in for a lot of trouble. It's funny how now I'm 10 years old and just about a man, I can see how mama was so wrong. She was wrong because she probably should have told me the things she thought was t I was too young to hear because now that she's gone, I'll never know what they were. Even if I was too young back then, I could have rememberized them and use them when I did get help, like right when I did need help, like right now. She was also wrong when she thought I'd understand that nonsense about doors closing and opening all by themselves. Back then, it would really scared me because I couldn't see what one door closing had to do with another one opening unless there was a ghost involved. All her talk made me start jamming a chair up against my closet door at night. But now that I'm almost grown, I see mama wasn't talking about doors opening to let ghosts into your bedroom. She meant doors like the door at the home closing leading to the door at the Amos's opening and the door in the shed opening leaving, leading me sleeping under a tree getting ready to open the next door. I checked out the other things in my suitcase and they seemed okay. I felt a lot better. Right now I'm too tired to think anymore, so I closed my suitcase, put the proper knots back in the twine, crawled under the Christmas tree, and wrapped myself in the blanket. I'd have to wake up real early if I wanted to get to the mission in time for breakfast. If you were one minute late, they wouldn't let you in for food. All right, that's the end of chapter five. Bud's really been thinking. Let's see what he's going to be doing in chapter six. So stay with me.